pray that your Holy Spirit would just minister, Lord, to each person here and to each person watching online. God, that you would heal marriages. Lord, that you would comfort the oppressed. And Lord, for those that are sick, including our president, God, we pray that you would heal them. God, that you would give them health and strength. And Lord, I pray that you would meet every need represented here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, if we need more chairs, uh, there's tons of chairs inside, so uh, let us know if we need more chairs. I'm just going to pause them all. Thank you, Scott. All right, how's everybody doing? Okay, on your handout, you can see a timeline on the back, and uh, go ahead and look at that. I, I have a few corrections. Hold on one second. It's very interesting to me that the Bible predicted exactly the geopolitical climate that we're seeing happen around the world today. On this timeline, and by the way, if you're watching online, if you want a copy of the timeline, just email me or message me and we can get you a copy. But it starts at 70 AD. That is when uh, Jesus predicted the temple would be uh, torn down, Daniel predicted it as well, that the people of the prince who is to come, that's the false messiah or the antichrist, would be the ones that destroy Jerusalem. They did it in 70 AD. There's a few verses to substantiate that. 1917, the end time curtain began. How do we know that? Because God said in the last days, I will draw my people from the four corners of the earth back to the land that I gave their forefathers. So make no mistake about it, folks, we are in the last days. I know people are trying to say, well, people have been saying that for since Paul's time, you know, 2,000 years. Well, yeah, they have, but they had no right to say it because Israel was not back in the land. There's no way the end times could be here. And in fact, until they took Jerusalem in 1967 on your timeline, we really weren't in the end times. Because that's when they truly got the land of their forefathers back, 1967. 1948, they became a nation. The 1980s, they began to make the desert bloom. And remember last week we talked about how uh, Mark Twain visited Israel and said, it is a God-forsaken, desolate land. Now they fill literally the world with their fruit. And that was prophesied in Isaiah 35, 1 and 2, and Isaiah chapter 41, verse 18. 2017, another jubilee, and notice how God's timing is perfect. And you can read about the jubilee in Leviticus 25, 10. It's on your handout. But it says every 50 years, the land will be returned to the original owner. The slaves will be set free. Every 50 years, it's a jubilee. It is a celebration. And we notice 1917, they, they begin to gather. 50 years, they take back Jerusalem. 50 years later, we and other nations recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And not just the capital. The Bible said that the northern kingdom, Judah, and the southern kingdom, Israel, they've been divided. You know that. It said, in the last days, not only will I bring my people, but no longer will Judah be separated from Israel. They will be an undivided uh, kingdom, and Jerusalem will be the capital. And so we see that happening even now. 2020, that peace um, confirmation that, that Trump is doing with uh, the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with possibly, and it has to happen, Saudi Arabia has to be a part of this. How do we know that? Because the next big battle, if you see it there, is the Gog Magog, Ezekiel chapter 38 war. That's the alignment of Russia, Iran, Turkey, part of Syria, uh, parts of Sudan, and, and those African nations. But Saudi Arabia, 
uh, and all those nations that are now coming on board with normalizing relationships with Israel are not part of the Gog Magog conglomeration of nations. So Saudi Arabia more than likely will be part of that peace. A lot of people are saying, well, Trump might be the Antichrist or Krishner or Kirshner, his son in law. Uh, possibly, but I don't think so. Here's why. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, when the false Messiah comes on the scene, it says this about him. It'll start the last seven years. Known, we call it the tribulation. In the Bible, it's called the 70th week of Daniel. The, the tribulation really doesn't begin until the breaking of the sixth seal, which is after the abomination of desolation. So, I mean, the tribulation really is halfway into it. Then great tribulation comes. The first half is just natural events. But what we find that last seven-year period is started when the false Messiah enacts a peace covenant with many, or literally the verbiage is, confirms a treaty with many. So it could be that Trump's treaty that he's putting in place right now, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will confirm that treaty. Because that's exactly how the verbiage in Daniel 9.27 says. So it's kind of interesting that is there. So do I think Trump is the Antichrist? No, I do not. And I didn't think Obama was the Antichrist either. Seems like every president we have, people say it's the Antichrist. His name, you know, numbers up to 666. And, you know, I, I mean, throughout the generations, we've been trying to put that title on some guy. Folks, when he comes on the scene, he is going to woo the world. He is going to be the greatest diplomat the world has ever seen. He is going to make the world fall in love with him, and the world will be enamored with this guy. And he's going to confirm a treaty with many. Now, we know that all the geopolitical climate, and we're going to talk about that today, how what's going on right now, and how does it line up with Bible prophecy? One is a call for globalization. You know, in the Bible, God says, in the last days, I'm going to put it in the hearts of men to come together as one, to be like one nation. When's the last time the whole world came together as one? The Tower of Babel. Who remembers that story? The Tower of Babel, we all spoke the same language. There was no separate governments. Even though people lived in separate territories, they were still one. And what did God do? He confused their languages. He spread them over across the face of the earth because men begin to worship men when we have all of this together like that. In the last days, uh, Satan will do it again, the false messiah. The rise of LGBTQ and craziness. The Bible says in the last days, men will burn with passion for men and women with women. In the last days. Why do you think it's happening, folks? Because the Bible said in the last days, this is going to happen. I know I'm probably going to get a ton of emails about this. You know, bring it on. i got to preach the Word of God. Loss of morals. Loss of morals and Judeo-Christian ethics. Folks, if you look around the world, if you just turn on any movie or television show, most of the things in those programmings are against the Judeo-Christian ethics of the Bible. Men calling good bad and bad good. Do you see it? The Bible said in the last days that's going to happen. Increase in racial tensions. Where do we get that? Turn to Matthew 24. If you have your Bibles, if not, I'll read it. Matthew chapter 24. By the way, if there is one place to go to understand the last days, it is Christ confirming to the disciples what will be the sign of his coming and the end of the age, the end of the church age. The sign of his coming, meaning the rapture. And Jesus said this, verse 4, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and mislead many. That's the first seal of Revelation 6, the Antichrist coming on the scene. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened. These things must take place, but the end is not yet. That's the second seal in Revelation chapter 6, war. 
Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Interesting, the word nation there is ethnos, where we get ethnicity. And so what he's saying is not only will kingdom fight against kingdom, but racial tensions in the last day are going to increase. Ethnicity against ethnicity. White versus black. Hispanic versus South Asian. I mean, we're going to have these racial tensions. We can see it all over the world. People are going crazy right now. It says it's, that's part of one of the signs. Uh, all these are, me- oh, then earthquakes in various places. Pestilent, that means new sicknesses like, guess what, COVID. <laughs> you know, SARS. All the things. I mean, all these things are beginning to increase in number, folks, the whole world, even atheists, know something crazy is going on. And, and it's not natural. It's not just uh, natural selection. It's not evolution because the world is on the cusp of something crazy. The whole world knows it. They're looking for, guess who? That false messiah that's going to confirm peace, that's going to be the savior, that's going to have an answer to hunger and an answer to racial tensions and an answer to everything else. Boy, how convenient. You just take that mark, that chip, that tattoo, whatever it is. Uh, Thank you, brother. (laughs) And you can buy, sell, open doors. You can do whatever you want with that thing. You you no, no longer need cash. And who wants to touch cash anyway? It's all probably covered with COVID, you know? Isn't it funny? Where did the change go? Did you ever wonder that? Before the crisis, we had just as much change as we do now. Are, is someone hoarding, you know, the pennies and nickels? You know, it's like, are quarters being hoarded? What for? And get ready, folks. Verse 8 of Matthew 24. Oh, these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. The idea is this. What was it? 24 weeks ago, God put it on our heart to do 40 Sundays, 40 weeks, nine months to freedom. This series will end January 31st, 2021. God told us 24 weeks ago when we started these 40 weeks to freedom that we need to get ready. What do we need to get ready for? Well, what does Jesus say in the next verse? Verse 9. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Isn't that a great promise for the church? (laughs) At that time, many will fall away. You know what that's called? That's called apostasy. Keep your thumb here and flip over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. By the way, do we see people abandoning truth and apostatizing the, the faith already? We do. But it's not until the whole world hates Christians that Jesus said the apostasy will come. And Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, two events that must precede the rapture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. It says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that's the rapture, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or message or letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That's that great falling away in Matthew 24 where Jesus says, you'll be hated by all nations on account of my name. At that time, the apostasy will occur. Folks, Christians still aren't hated by every nation. Not yet, but it's getting close, isn't it? Even in America. What did they call us in 2016? Deplorables and all kinds of other weird stuff. All right, so... You go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one in any way deceive you. How did Jesus start that discourse in Matthew 24? Remember in verse 3? The disciples said, hey, tell us when uh, you're going to come and get us in the end of the age. And Jesus said, see to it that no one misleads you. Verse 4. In Thessalonians, Paul said, see to it that no one misleads you. 
that you're not deceived, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. That's the false Messiah, the Antichrist. Verse 4, who oppresses and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Two things that have to happen in Israel still. They need to rebuild their temple because the false Messiah will go into the rebuilt temple and proclaim himself as God. Remember in Revelation 13, Satan gives the false Messiah all of his rule and authority. Did he try to give it to anybody else in the Bible? Yeah, when he tempted Jesus and he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and Satan said, if you bow down to me, I will give you all the kingdoms. Guess what? If Christ had done that, he would have been the false Messiah. Of course, we know that couldn't have happened. (laughs) But the false Messiah in these last days will bow down to Satan and Satan is going to give him his throne and ultimately, exactly as Satan went crazy in heaven, he did. He's, he's not normal in the head. You know that, right? Okay. Uh, pride, ultimate pride, leads to insanity. It's narcissism to the nth degree. It's, uh, and, and Satan became that and said, I will make my throne equal with God. Well, the Antichrist is going to do even above what Satan did. He's going to say, I'm going to make my throne above God's. Satan will be so prideful and full of himself. And then all hell will break loose. So Matthew 24, we we see all these things and signs. And if you read it along with Revelation chapter 6, which I put those, um, did I put that on that timeline? Oh, I didn't. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I didn't. Oh, yeah, I did. So see the the very small little seals at the end of your timeline in color? Yeah, I need better glasses. See how small I put that? It's like, okay, wow, I need a magnifying glass. So those are the seals. Seal one is the Antichrist. Seal two is war. Seal three is earthquakes and famine. Uh, Seal four is terrorism and pestilence or sickness. Seal five is Christians being killed for their faith. Then's the middle point of the last seven years, the abomination of desolation, when the false Messiah goes into the rebuilt temple on the temple mount and proclaims himself as God. That's when he's revealed as the false Messiah. Seal six starts the great tribulation. The sun grows dark. The moon doesn't give its light. At at that seal six, there's a resurrection from the dead, Daniel chapter 12, which we're going to talk about next week. All the innocents will be removed, and from that point on, the last three and a half years, all of Israel is saved and taken to the wilderness and protected, and God's wrath is poured out on this planet for three and a half years. At the end of the three and a half years, the false messiah the false prophet, and Satan himself gather all the armies of the world to the valley of Megiddo, and they wait to fight Jesus when he returns at the second coming. They know the exact day when Jesus will return. Why? It is seven years exactly from when the false Messiah enacted that confirmation of a peace treaty with many. So they will know the exact time of the second coming. In fact, they're going to be at Megiddo waiting for Jesus to come, and we will come with them riding on horses. Now consider that. I don't know if you love to ride horses. I love it. But there's animals in heaven because we're coming from the third heaven, God's throne. And by the way, it's immense. Do you know our whole universe is a bubble and surrounded by our whole universe is the third heaven, which is God's dwelling place from eternity past? It is huge, bigger than our whole universe, and it surrounds our whole universe. Our universe is a bubble, and the third heaven is all around it. Think about that for a minute. (laughs) So the Valley of Megiddo is... um, a valley in the northern part of Israel. So you can look it up on a map. It's a big valley, and the blood is going to come to the horse's bridle. Uh, it's it's going to be a, a, a horrible, horrible thing. We won't fight Jesus 
with the word of his mouth, they will be slain. And he will then go immediately to Zion, set foot on the Mount of Olives. It'll split, and he will walk through the eastern gate onto the Temple Mount and establish his millennial reign for a thousand years. And we will reign with Christ, the Bible promises, for a thousand years during that time. So you have that uh, there. So at second coming, after the second coming is the millennial reign of Christ. After the millennial reign is the white throne judgment, the final judgment. This heaven and earth is passed away. The final judgment, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, and our eternal state. We will live in this incredible city, the new Jerusalem, that's 1,500 miles long, wide, and high. Think about the, the highest uh, uh, mansions in this city. You know, it's a cube-like city, or it could be a pyramid, because uh, it doesn't say cube. It just says long, wide, and high. So a pyramid could be 1,500 miles high. And uh, it, it, we're all going to have a great view. I, I know that. <laughs> uh, and we're going to talk about that in two weeks, uh, the eternal state. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's, it's amazing. If you can, if you have a pen on your handout, 2020, it says, uh, peace with the United Arab Emirates and Saudi. I believe Saudi has to jump into that because they're not part of the Ezekiel 38 Gog Magog war. So where it says the Gog Magog nations, you could add Sheba and Dedan in Ezekiel 38, 13 are Saudi Arabia. And it says they will protest when Russia and Iran attack Israel. Why? Because they are normalizing relations with Israel now. And Israel is saying, man, if Iran, and by the way, Iran hates Saudi Arabia and they hate the United Arab Emirates and all of that. It's the Shiites versus the Sunni Muslims. And they, they really can't stand each other. <laughs> and Iran wants to take over Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, which is the number one holy site for Muslims. So when these normalizations happen, Sheba and Dedan, which is Saudi Arabia, has to be part of that. Folks, we see that happening right now with this peace plan that Trump is doing. Make no mistake about it, this is the most significant thing I think that's happened in the past, well, in 2017, he recognized Jerusalem as a capital. So that was pretty significant. But since then, it's probably the most significant thing, biblically, because it's setting up those nations to fulfill Ezekiel 38, 13. Sheba and Dedan in that passage say, man, we're having trade with them. You're coming down to all our spoils. What spoils? Well, Israel has now discovered what uh, this uh, natural gas reserve that is huge. One, one of the biggest in the world, I think, in Israel. So all of, all of that is coming together. Keep your eye on Russia, Iran, Turkey, Syria, and those nations that are part of the Gog Magog conglomeration because they are all aligning. Now, here's what's interesting. The United Nations, or not the United Nations, the EU, the European Union, now says, hey, we're going to not do sanctions on Iran. They, they just released last week, even if the United States tries to do sanctions, we're not going to do it. Well, Iran, did you hear about the wrestler that they, they uh, tortured and then killed? Okay, he was a wrestler in Iran who was just protesting some of the atrocities that uh, the government is doing against its people. He was a famous wrestler in Iran. Everyone loved him. And they tortured him and killed him because he just spoke out against the Iranian regime. And the EU is supporting that. Now, why is that interesting? Because the Western European Union, and by the way, on your timeline, 1948, Israel, the nation was established. Guess what else was established? The Western European Union. That's Rome revived. So if you want, you could write in your timeline, 1948, not only was Israel revived, but Rome was revived. And the Bible said in the last days, I will revive Rome. They will come back together, and the Antichrist will come out of Rome. What is the Western European Union? It is the exact footprint 
of the ancient Roman Empire before it dissolved. It is the exact 10 nations that made up the Roman Empire before it dissolved. And here they came together in 1948. Last week I talked a little bit about it, but in 2011, they had document number 666 that established the high representative, a man who could make covenants and peace treaties for the, United, or the European Union. Okay. I believe it's significant. Why? Because it looks like the EU is going to support Iran at least for a while. We know the Gog-Magog battle when that happens. China is aligning with them too, but China's the king of the east, a separate power block during this time. And we're going to hopefully talk about that in a minute. What do we got? 20 minutes. We're doing good. All right. The Bible predicted all of this would happen. Folks, if you look at the world, if you look at technology, you know the two witnesses that are going to witness for the first three and a half years of the last seven years? The Bible says in the book of Revelation, they will be killed and their bodies will lay on the street for three and a half days. Interesting. And it says the whole world, everyone will see them and rejoice that the two witnesses have been killed. They are going to throw parties, the whole world, when they watch these bodies lie on the street three and a half days. How are they going to do that? Live stream, television? Folks, not until live stream and television could people live watch something all over the world that's occurring in one place. So even that had to be part of the equation. So we could even say Jesus couldn't have come before television that could be live all over the world, where the whole world could see these bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. By the way, at the end of the three and a half days, they'll be raised up. And uh, then all hell is going to break loose on this planet. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. All right. There are so many signs that God has given us about the last day from uh, Israel being back into the land to the ge um, geopolitical uh, gathering of nations that we see all over the world today. Remember this. In 2 Thessalonians, we just read about the rapture. We read that two events have to occur before the rapture can occur, the apostasy and the Antichrist being revealed. All right. A lot of people say that is in reference to the second coming not the rapture. Turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. All the tea books are together. Just before the coffee book, Hebrews. Yeah, okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our gathering together to him. No one questions that, that this is the rapture. Everybody knows that. Here's where it gets weird in their hermeneutic, which is the science of interpreting Scripture, the next verse. See to it that you're not quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit or message or letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Oh, well, that's the second coming. Okay, wait a minute. So they say verse 1 is the rapture, and verse 2 is the second coming. Why do they have to say that? Because there's two events that have to occur before the day of the Lord. And the two events are the great apostasy and the Antichrist being revealed as the Antichrist. That's in the next verse. So it has to be, the day of the Lord has to be the second coming. It can't be the rapture. Next week, we're going to cover all the day of the Lord verses. Guess what? Paul said, hey, I will, Jesus will confirm you to the end blameless in the day of the Lord, Jesus Christ. In fact, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And this clarifies when the day of the Lord occurs. Or actually, chapter 5. It says, Now to the times and the epochs or seasons, brethren, 
First uh, Thessalonians chapter five, verse one. You have no need for anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Folks, the second coming, everybody knows the exact day. They're actually gathered at the Valley of Megiddo to fight Jesus at the second coming. Doesn't overtake them like a thief. The armies of the world are already there waiting for Christ to come. The only day in the Bible that comes like a thief, there's two. Rosh Hashanah. Remember, that's the hidden feast. No one knows the day or the hour and the rapture of the church. No one knows the day or the hour. It's the only day that comes like a thief. Note this. For you yourselves, verse 2, know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they are saying peace and safety, and by the way, they do that the first half of the 70th week of Daniel. They say peace and safety. The false Messiah has enacted a, a, a false peace with the world. When they kill the two witnesses, they throw a party and they say, finally, the world is ours. We've come together as a global government. We've solved all the world's problems and we've killed those two cantankerous prophets that would cause all all hell to break loose around Jerusalem. We finally destroyed them. They're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come and that's the breaking of the sixth seal. We're going to get into that next week. But note this verse 4, oh, verse 3 again. When they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains and upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, note this, are not in darkness that that day would overtake you like a thief. What day? The day of the Lord. What's the day of the Lord? It begins with the rapture. Okay, are you with me? Okay, so we need to get ready for that. In fact, throughout the New Testament, it says, saints of God, endure to the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus said in the last days, you're going to be hated by all. There's going to be a great falling away from the truth. Barna did a a survey, and it asked Christians what their worldview was. Right now, between 6 and 12 percent, that's it, of the church have a biblical worldview. That scares me. I mean, a completely biblical worldview. And Barna had like 35 points that if you held to all 35, you held to a biblical worldview. The more you compromise, the less you are part of the biblical worldview. Gosh, folks. Man, Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? Folks, he's talking about returning for the church. The kind of men and women and young people we need to be in these last days is someone that have a complete faith in God and are ready to die for that faith. Jesus said, speaking of the last days, he who wishes to save his life will do what? Lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake, oh man, he's going to get so much more. Folks, all, all I know, and I know this isn't a popular message, and some of you are like, oh, man, why, why are we having to listen to this? I like the message down the street that says, hey, don't worry, we're not going to have to see any problems. Jesus wouldn't do that to his bride. He's going to come get us before it gets bad. Don't worry, we're all okay. I'm okay and you're okay. <laughs> you know, it's all going to be a bed of roses, and then Jesus is going to come and take us, and then all the bad stuff happens. No. The parable of the ten virgins is quite clear in Matthew 25. There's ten virgins waiting for the rapture. All of them have lamps. They're all lit. They're all waiting. But the wise ones got extra oil so they could endure to the midnight hour, the darkest time, the most difficult time for the church. You know, in First Peter, Peter wrote, Don't be deceived. Judgment is going to start with the church. And then it'll move to the world. Believe me, there is coming a time of refining for the church, a time to get serious about your faith. There will be no uh, Sunday Christians. You're either a full, born-again, spirit-filled man or woman or young person of God, or you have rejected truth and part of the apostasy. 
It'll, it'll be clear. There's going to be no middle ground. As for me, we need to occupy. We need to prepare. We need to be those five wise virgins who had the extra oil. And by the way, they went out to meet the bridegroom. They didn't just sit around in the house not knowing the day. They knew the day, not the hour. <laughs> Jesus gave us signs. We're going to talk about this. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, the early church, all the way up to the late 1800s, knew they would see Antichrist before the rapture. Every writing of the early church says, man, the Antichrist is going to come. He's going to persecute us and refine the church, and then Jesus will come and rapture us and rescue us from the wrath that is to come the last half of the 70th week of Daniel. That's why John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, in the Greek it's clear, he's coming and you will see him. You're getting ready for that persecution that's coming where many are going to fall away and you'll be hated by all nations, Jesus said, on account of my name. But it's the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. To the end of what? Either you're killed or you die or you go up in the rapture. The end of your life or the end of the church age. He who keeps the faith, who runs the race to the end, he will be saved. And that could be if you die in a car accident on the way home today, that's your end. <laughs> so be faithful to the end. There's seven power blocks in these last days, and I just want to go over them really quick. Uh, one is the remnant bride of Christ. Folks, the church, in fact, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. What does he mean by that? Do gates move? Yes, it does. When, when a kingdom conquers more land, guess what they do? They move their gates. So if we were to conquer Tijuana, then our border would be moved. Our gate would be moved to the other side of Tijuana. Does that make sense? So what Jesus said there, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Meaning, church, you're going to be around when the false Messiah sets up Satan's demonic reign over the whole world, and the gates of hell will encompass the entire world, the, the false Messiah's kingdom, but it will not prevail against the true church. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In fact, Jesus said, you will do greater things that, than I did. The first sermon to the church at Pentecost, Peter quoted Joel chapter 2. And that sermon was the start of the church, and the Bible always has bookends, and it will be the church of the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. There will be a resurgence in the gift of the Holy Spirit, but a proper use, not the crazy, wild stuff that you see. You see, one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So anytime someone loses control emotionally, they're not being driven by the Spirit. They're being driven by the flesh or by Satan himself or a demonic force or something other than the Spirit because Self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit, so the empowering of the Spirit accentuates self-control, if that makes sense. All right, so the church, that's one power block. The king of the south, that's probably Saudi Arabia, and that's Dedan and Sheba, and they will align with Israel against the Gog-Magog nations that come against Israel. Uh, the king of the east is probably China and Southeast Asia. The revived Roman Empire, which is the Western European Union. Babylon. Okay, that's we're going to talk about that. Right now, I believe the United States is the only nation in the world that fulfills the requirement, all the prophetic requirements of Babylon. They'll be the world uh, leader in the last days before the Antichrist. They will be uh, the greatest superpower in the last days just before the Antichrist. They will import more goods than any other nation in the world. In fact, when Babylon is destroyed, the merchants of the earth, it says, will stand off in their boats offshore, their merchant ships, and say, who are we going to sell our goods to? 
All right, we're going to talk more about that. I think we're, we could be Babylon. The king of the north, that's the Gog Magog alliance, and the Psalm 83 nations, that's Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, all the nations right around Israel that are not part of the Gog Magog alliance. So we have all of the world lined up exactly as the Bible predicted. We have the ability to go cashless today. Uh, the, no, no other time in history could that have ever occurred. So the mark of the beast to buy and sell with just a mark on your hand or on your forehead, it's crazy. Yeah, I heard some guys say, hey, you know how you get, a, get your temperature when you walk into places? It's just programming people to get ready for the mark. You know, I don't know about that, but it's kind of interesting. All right, so the Gog, Magog, Ezekiel, 38 nations. I want to go, I, this is who you need to watch right now, this alignment, because this could be the next significant event. Russia, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, Turkey, Iraq, Pakistan, part of Syria, modern-day Turkey, and part of Af Afghanistan. All of these nations are going to be a part of the Ezekiel 38 conglomeration of nations that will attack Israel. This could be the next battle. Why? It will take them seven years to dismantle the weapons from this battle. Seven years. It has to happen prior to the Antichrist coming on the scene. Why? Because when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom, the earth becomes a paradise again. The lion lays down with the lamb. We won't be still dismantling weapons from the former age. Does that make sense? The whole world is going to be made new at the second coming of Christ. It's going to be a beautiful paradise like the Garden of Eden for a thousand years. We won't need to burn weapons. Thus, the Gog-Magog battle has to happen before the Antichrist comes on the scene. So I believe this could be the next event. Okay, this conglomeration. And it's crazy because uh, think tanks around the world, when Russia began to align with Turkey and Iran, they're like, what strange bedfellows? In fact, the New York Times actually wrote an article Strange bedfellows, the Russia-Turkish-Iranian axis. The Jerusalem Post also published that uh, January 25th, 2017, when they started to align, when we began to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which it had to be because Jerusalem in the last days in Zechariah says will be a trembling cup for the whole world. It will be the capital of the nation of Israel. They had to take Jerusalem. It had to be recognized as the capital. So all of these things are being lined up. I believe, folks, in 1917, the last days began. Make no mistake about it. No matter what anybody says, we are living in the last days. Now, here's the caveat. In 1 John, we read, children, we know it's the last hour because, uh, and we know that Antichrist is coming. Okay, he wrote that almost 2,000 years ago. If it was the last hour then, we must be in the last 10 seconds, you know. Uh, because all, if it was the last hour then, and by the way, then it's like, okay, Israel was still in the land of Israel. But what John forgot is they hadn't been dispersed yet. There had to be a dispersion. That was prophesied throughout the Bible. I'm going to throw you out in the four corners of the earth. I'm going, to, I'm going to take your land. You'll have nothing to do with it. It will become a desolation. But in the last days, I'll draw you back to the land that I gave your fathers, and you will make the desert bloom. They've done that just in the past 50 years. Okay. I believe we're in the last days. I believe that it cannot be an accident that Russia has aligned with Iran and Turkey and these other nations are Muslim nations that are going to join that battle when it all comes down. I can't believe that Saudi Arabia and those nations aren't part of that and that now are aligning with Israel. Folks, that normalization with Israel is fulfillment of Bible prophecy. I don't know how the media 
I, I, I don't know how Trump can't get the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the most incredible peace deal in the world. Everybody has been trying to bring peace to the Middle East. Everyone, every president, everyone since 1948. Everybody, and everyone said it, it's impossible. It can't happen. Even Kerry, what, in 2015 was like, unless uh, Israel aligns with the Palestinians and they become peaceful together, there's no way Israel can have peace with any of the Arab nations around them. Well, when Kerry said that, they already had peace treaties with Jordan and Egypt. So it's not impossible. In fact, Kerry lied when he said that. They already had treaties with Jordan and Egypt. Now they're having treaties. I, ho I know it has to be Saudi Arabia has to ju jump on board with that. But the United Arab Emirates and uh, Bahrain and uh, Abu Dhabi. I love the way you say that, Mike. <laughs> You've been there a lot. Yeah, hey, what are you guys saying about all that over there? Yeah, the, the normalization. Have you heard? Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Mike knows people. All right, and the Psalm 83 nations, which you can read later. I'm just going to list them real quick. They're the ones immediately around Israel. And that will happen, by the way, either the, the second seal, which is war, or it'll happen right before the Gog Magog and be the catalyst that uh, makes the Gog Magog battle happen. The nations in Psalm 83 are not the nations in Ezekiel 38. And so these are the ones right around Israel. And it's a war that needs to be fought because it, it never actually has. So it's Palestinians, Jordan, um, Central Jordan, uh, the Egyptians, Hezbollah, which, by the way, Hezbollah now has strongholds in Jordan, in Egypt, in Lebanon, and Syria. And Iran is back in Hezbollah. And so it's very interesting. It's going to be a two-front war. Psalm 83 is going to be one either right before Gog Magog or right after because they'll oppose the false peace that the false messiah brings. Okay, so it could be the second seal because the second seal is war. And that's in Matthew 24 when Jesus said, Though you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of war. See to it that you're not frightened. It's just the beginning of birth pains. And birth pains always refer to that last seven-year period. Okay, all right. So anyway, gosh, if you have questions, email me or message me. Um, next week, we're going to talk about what happens during after the Antichrist comes on scene and who the Antichrist might be. I'm not going to name names. I'm just going to give you a description that the Bible gives. Okay, here's what the Bible says the Antichrist will be like. We can't speculate, not yet, um, but it will be interesting. At least we'll have an idea, okay, this is who the Antichrist is going to be according to the Bible and how he comes to power. So we're going to talk about that and the events of the last seven years before the second coming of Christ. Come on up, worship team. The Psalm 83 war, by the way, is in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1 as well. And in Isaiah 17, 1, it says, Damascus will become a ruinous heap. Damascus is the capital of Syria. Syria is one of the nations in the Psalm 83 war. It's interesting, Damascus is the oldest perpetually populated city in the world. It's always had people there. It is the oldest perpetually populated city in the world, and Isaiah 17 says it'll become a ruinous heap. That will happen during the Psalm 83 war. So you can read Psalm 83. Note this about Psalm 83 as well. The Bible says they're going to get together and say, let's remove Israel from being a nation that their name would no longer be remembered. Guess what Muslims are saying in those countries right now? Let's remove Israel from being a country. They are literally saying verbatim what Psalm 83 said they would as they plan 
to wipe them out and destroy them. Here's the other interesting part. Psalm 83, it says the Philistines will join in that against them. Guess the land of Philistia is the Gaza Strip. So the, even that had to be carved out. They couldn't have taken over the Gaza Strip, which is part of their country, because it says in Psalm 83 that, that that geographic part will come against Israel with the other Psalm 83 nations. The Bible is perfectly lined up everything that our world is doing right now. God knew it. He predicted it. We need to get ready to endure to the end. Amen. God bless you. And let's sing this song to the Lord. Everybody got that? <laughs> Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day. And God, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. God, that you would give us strength and peace. Lord, that you would just...
go before us, Lord. And God, in the days ahead, I pray that you would empower us to do great exploits for your kingdom. Lord, that even as Paul, we can say we fought the good fight. We finished the course. We run the race. So God, I pray that you would just fill us. Let us experience your love and peace. And we pray, God, that even as Jesus, you commanded us to pray, Father, let your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.